1,435 canine teams and 127 horse patrols. Have, you, have any of you seen the horse patrols in which they use uh, lassos in, in order to keep patients up? And it reminds me uh, very much of pictures of, uh, of a southern plantation. Flew 207 enforcement hours, under, underway 74 float hours, conducted, are you ready for this? Look at this category. Conducted operations in 106 countries with more than 697 CPP employees working in traditional. So this is not just a national kind of effort. And 328 points of the soil. Let's one think this, these are but low, uh, recent low intensity war artifacts, such as militarization harkens back much earlier. And this is equipment and, in fact, um, materials that were provided to the Border Patrol going back uh, as early as 1978, and this is just between 1978 and 1982. And if you look at the left hand side, the left hand side gives you the general category, the right side of the specific activities. And uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but just to give you an idea of its international dimensions, look at LIC operational characteristics, the very last square. Coordination and integration of distinct forces, especially force with military. Again, you have this integration of, the, of, of police actions with the military itself. Military training of local forces, military training exercise outside of military bases, emphasis on intelligence efforts, and so on. In the post-9-11 era, particularly with the creation of the right of homeland security, then the sophistication and capabilities of the arsenal have not abated. This militarization is part of a more global process of constructing war fortresses as seen all over the world. Post-9-11, then, between 2003 and the Central Coordinating Agency of Homeland Security, it itself has increased 15-fold in personnel and armaments. They switched from, M from pistols to M16s, which are automatic weapons that were first used in Vietnam in 1965. They created SWAT and special operational teams. Some of the latter were introduced by the Trump administration to quell protests and some of the American citizens concomitant to the rise of the Black Lives Matter. These advantages are coupled with detection, do detection dogs, vehicle barriers, and surveillance equipment, such as sensors, floodlights, uh, trip wire cameras, mobile observation towers, radar blimps, and so on and so on. The cost of articulation of such policy and operation, excluding state and local expenditures, between 1990 and 2010 and 2020 was $4.09 billion. So that in total, what one has then is this low intensity militarized assistance has totaled $560 billion between 2017 and 2022, only in previous insight. A salient uh, element strongly associated with this NECO process is the use of terror to disguise, prevent, or remove any and all incriminating or oppositional communication of arrest, detention, and violations of law, and procedure in regard to undocumented and even citizen persons. The most recent example of which is the attempted suppression of a three-year film project that shows the manner in which ICE became an instru instrument of repression and terror, according to a recent analysis by Dickerson in the New York Times. Uh, and the series that was entitled Immigrant Nation. A still from the first episode of Immigrant Nation shows people that were arrested by ICE, including some that were not even the targets. If you look at the deadly walls of a la Trump, from link fences to steel concertina wires. This is Nogales, Arizona. Look at the date on this, colleagues. The date of this is February the 2nd, 2019. Look at this. And I'll repeat it. Let me go back. Yeah. February the 2nd, 2019. And its completion uh, by February the 4th. This is all concertina wire and uh, colleagues and students and, and friends. This concertina wire was exactly the concertina wire that was used in Vietnam to keep, to keep the bad guys out of your books. That's why you're shaking your head because you recognize it, right? Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, this, this stuff cuts. 
And there's another little element that an awful lot of people don't understand about this, some parts of these walls, is that there are large boulders that in fact are inserted in the cement. So if anybody falls from the, from the top of the, the, the top of the wall, with or without comes in the water, they will hit it on an object and break it back. So all of these, these can be in fact uh, very big. The essence of expected death did not begin, however, with Trump's beautiful wall. It is also found in the destruction of the All-American Canal, the channels water from the Colorado River to the Yuba Valley and the Imperial Valley. The 82-mile uh, canal whose construction started in the 1930s and through the 1942. It's considered the most dangerous body of water in the U.S. So over 500 known migrants have died in the canal itself. Ironically, or perhaps fitting, the, name, the, the, the chief engineer for that was John L. Savage. But the clear presence of extreme violence related to the wall is exemplified by border patrol officers who also shoot across that line and kill uh, many times in this And of course, here is an example of uh, the various uh, wall uh, models that were created and their costs associated with They finally selected one of them. Uh, and this, of course, is uh, Trump's eight uh, wall prototypes. Now, the wall is more important than you think, cognitively. Lest we think that its symbolic and cultural impact has not been effective, please note the digital game within the Border Security Wall Construction 8P by 220 games incorporated. Players, quote, are able to play the role of building and defending. Enjoy the Army duty games for the country defense and for your home defense. Thus the, significant, thus the integration of the border fence and the border of the home are accomplished as part of the cognitive infrastructure to be repeated and manipulated. So that at every successive turn, the player receives not only satisfaction of accomplishing a goal, but the goal of interdiction, of eliminating the danger from the player's family, becomes interlocked with, without reflection and accentuates the normalcy of the act itself. The player learns to learn multiple layers of meaning, reinforced by seeming play and pleasure, creating a foundation for uncritical acceptance of violent, militarized borders or of an already accepted violent picture that is ex expanded effortlessly by creating the best and most effective border wall impediment. And of course, this becomes internalized for sure. The building of the wall involved other forms of violence. Construction required the setting aside of com com uh, conversation, uh, I'm sorry, conservation, riparian laws, environmental protection laws, as well as the generally cybersack notion of private property. Laws were set aside for these and other similar projects as well as the development of the internal surveillance apparatuses and so on. In addition, there's one last element of the NECRO state, the NECRO network on the US side, which ultimately is the most deadly thing that I'll talk to you about, and that is the weaponization of the political ecology of the region. And this was done by, in fact, providing a funnel created by checkpoints. These are the checkpoints check along the border. If you notice, the, 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 the spare number of checkpoints that uh, are, in fact, associated with Ohio, because that is the funnel to which an awful lot of, of this uh, wants to be taken. But there are also these other checkpoints that ensure uh, interdiction. But the primary tool for the policy of prevention through deterrence, and that's the phrase that's being used. These are, of course, uh, the casualties of this particular policy. The primary tool for the prevention through deterrence is the use of the Chihuahua and Sonora Desert, as well as the All-American Canal as weapons for the funneling of northbound migrants. The policy itself, initiated in 1994 by the Clinton administration and created by the Sandia National Laboratories, a subsidiary of Lockheed Martin was first drafted in 1993. Within this policy of deterrence were various measures, measurements for its efficacy. One indicator, according to the U.S. General Accounting Office, was, quote, the deaths of aliens attempting entry, which, if successful, would result in an increase. And, and it, minim it minimally accounted for 7,236 deaths between 1998 and 2017 
it is highly likely that in fact it is twice this. This gives you an indication each one of those little red boxes is a dead marker. And these are, this is, uh, as a matter of fact, one of my colleagues in anthropology, uh, De Leon, is responsible for this uh, rendition of, of these, of these uh, red marks that you saw by toe tags. These are the toe tags. But what you see in orange are identified toe tags, like identified with the individual whose toe tag it's associated with, while those that are, that are not orange, in fact, are people who have never been identified. <laughs> More than likely, there are about 15,000 that's between that group. And this is part of the killing grounds. Of the Sonoran Desert and Bird Nest Hill, the 23-year-old Roberto Sunun was found face down, nearly mummified and leached out, with his eye sockets filled with mud and insect carapaces, so that the 100,000 square miles of desert with 120 degree heat, no water, it's like a giant howitzer of a caliber larger than Great, Great Britain and half of Europe. And this is, in fact, Roberto in life in Guatemala. This picture was taken, in fact, about two months before his death. And this is his wife, Gatti, uh, who in fact had her first child uh, uh, in the exact. For the reason that, what's even more startling, in comp they, it is in fact in competition for the use of the space. The U.S. and Mexican governments declared it a zone of two militarized conflicts. The war on terror and the aftermath of 9-11 the war on drugs. Just to find legal exceptions in development and deployment of lethal weapons that ended up targeting who? Migrants and refugees. So let's look at the twin, the non-identical twin, the narco network. Mirroring these developments are the rise of the cultural emergence of drug cartels and many of the attendant behavioral and symbolic influences. Especially focused on the U.S. market that has given shape to and strongly influenced the quotidian lives of Mexicans by cartel violence. Such cultural behaviors, including impunity of action, influence of many parts of the political and security structure of the Mexican state, aspirational influences among poor youth, artistic and musical expressions, and public cultural influences. It is increasingly coming to resemble a narco state, in which many branches of government are heavily penetrated by drug money and influence to different degrees. Simultaneously carried out are the Mexican versions of the drug war with the concomitant loss of soldiers and citizens in the mix, and with its expression and disappearance carried out by military units. This creates an indistinguishable necro state, necro state political and civic process, as well as accompanied by extreme militarization. Thus, in the present, the region has been trained into mirrors of necro narco military structure relations, networks, and actions. Local communities on both sides of the region are subject to displacement, forced migration, deep physical and psychic distress, and the abrogation of civil rights. Narco citizenry is manifested in multiple contradictory ways. First, there's a sort of citizen quote unquote normalization of violent death that happens to others of a little feeding or concern is expressed toward, express towards young men in cartels or gangs being murdered. <clears throat> Simultaneously, hundreds of mothers search for their missing sons, poking uh, holes with rods to, for impossible mass burial grounds throughout Mexican states. Innocent victims are handed over by police for wholesale murder by cartels, as was the case for 43 male students from the Ayotzinapa uh, Sinapa Rural Teachers College were forcibly abducted and disappeared in Guadalajara, uh, Mexico. Even with great uproar nationally and internationally, the main investigator of the crime has himself disappeared and ended up, in fact, in Israel. As well as the narco industry is manifested by dislocation of regions throughout the Golden Triangle and Durango, Zacatecas, and Sinaloa, and certainly to different degrees throughout Mexico, 
and Mark, especially in states like Michoacán, Guerrero, and the northern states of Baja California, Sonora, Tamaulipas, Chihuahua, and Nuevo León. Thousands of the middle class have moved, them, have moved themselves as a business from cities like Tijuana, Novales, and Monterrey to the adjoining U.S. counterparts in San Diego and Paso Novales, Guerrero, and but there are also adaptations of normalizing the fear and impunity of the cartel for Mexican with attending negotiated daily adjustments to avoidance of care. The low intensity doctrine in Mexico and the creation of an American market web of Mexican cri of criminal notes have undermined whatever existing weak civil authority existed in Mexico and replaced it with penetrating networks of cartels that influence and manage political authority. Both utilize violence for its threats to establish the dynamic mirroring and, and militarization of the user, often expressed in the death of thousands. And here lies then the enormous contradiction that has emerged over the last 40 plus years, and especially since 1978. The rise within the American echo state apparatus and now extends directly and indirectly to South and San Diego, and the rise of the echo state apparatus, which extends throughout Mexico and on the border regions in terms of commerce, trade with guns and infusion of millions of dollars for a hungry American life. With it is the development of extra-legal authorities of the cartel so that even in some areas of northern Sonora, for example, around Bogotá, there's an actual, an actual little hut with a, with a wooden arm. It's, it's, by the way, I ran into a sliding glass for it. Uh, there, there's a, actually an arm that out in the middle of the desert that goes up and down that some, some of the uh, cartel members, in fact, manipulate. So whenever you have folks who want to get into, want to go into the American part of the desert, they raise the, the barrier up for them after they pay the fee. Which is ridiculous. So, how does this start? Well, actually, I'm going to be speaking quite a bit. And uh, only to share with you that, in fact, the opium trade in Mexico began, began in the late 19th century um, uh, with, in fact, the introduction of opium by uh, Chinese workers who, in fact, there were 5,000 Chinese workers who went and who worked in, in Sonora and Northern Mexico, and they introduced opium, but it was basically used only for local, local use. World War II came along, and, of course, uh, the military needed uh, narcotics in order to treat the wounded. It was used for morphine. The problem that arose, however, is that the, the American mafia took over the, that, that introduction after World War II, uh, from 1947 on, and then uh, really uh, basically took control of the uh, traversing of uh, illegal morphine and opium, and especially uh, opium and into the United States. And that's really the way it was the opium trade started in, in prison, uh, as well later on. There is this ridiculous uh, subtitle here, which is subtitled The Militarization of the Mexican Military. It may seem strange to refer to militarization process of the Mexican military since, by definition, its primary task is to engage as a body in the defense of the interests of Mexico. The irony is, is that until the rise of the cartels, the Mexican military has have been largely ceremonial. Poorly equipped and trained and a trained body designed to support the ruling political party, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, the PRI. In fact, following the election in 1946 of the first non military general grade officer after the Mexican Revolution of the civilian Avila Camacho, the following narrative held the military in a weak military state in a position with a, with a trade off. In the Mexican case, the military appeared to be under the control and command of civilian authorities. In this case, the president has commanded in chief. But there were, in essence, no other controls, either within the executive branch and definitely not within the legislative branch. This unwritten pact between the civilian political elite within the plea and the military permitted the plea to rule in exchange for their absence, for their absolute respect for the military and its legal, judicial, and budgetary autonomy. In return, the military would fully respect civilian power and defend it against any threats. So for the next 70 years, between the end of World War II and the election of the Pan candidate, 
we said to the Fox, this pact held. But this process also included over that long period of time and to the present, to different degrees, the corruption of the military has shown uh, in various ways, and especially of its top leadership by drug cartels, with the exception of the naval forces, including the Marine Corps. The latter being a reputation for not only effectiveness, but also civilian deaths and torture. But the military's role as both benefactor and protector of the ruling party changed by less attention paid to its previous roles, especially until the following presidency under Felipe Calderón, who not only tasked the military to undertake a war on drugs at the behest of the United States, but also initiated the militarization of the armed forces by the United States with millions of dollars in training and, and equipment until the president has been discussed uh, previously. The loss of military personnel, especially is indicative of the low intensity nature of the expanded military function, with 750 killed since two zero, between, zero zero, between 2006 and uh, 2019, and hundreds wounded in the military. It's the actual number of combat troops from more than 42,000. There is, however, important developments in this militarization process that more closely resemble the American military industrial complex and to what I have termed the public works complex, in which, in fact, the military has all public works being turned over to its control. And, and, as, and as well, the collection of revenues at ports as well as at as airports. So, in fact, the Mexican military now has to stand its own standalone budget. And let's get to the cartels. The cartels are mostly responsible for an American market trade for people who use drugs in the United States and spend it on the order of $150 billion on cocaine, heroin, marijuana, and mesothelines in 2016. The marijuana market is roughly the size of the cocaine and, uh, and meth markets combined, and the size of the retail heroin market is now closer to the size of the marijuana market than it is to other drugs. And by the way, the U.S. drug being uh, meth and practically typical of the cocaine trade was now that we really can infuse meth into the cocaine, and, uh, which, is, which makes it a much cheaper and much more profitable. Thus, the cartels account for a sizable amount as well of, of foreign currency uh, from these sources alone. The figure below shows the changing configurations of what these cartels look like. And if you'll notice, uh, you have different, uh, by the way, in Mexico, these are called plazas. That is, these are the areas under control of the, of, of the various cartels themselves. And you can see they range all the way from the Sinaloa cartel, which is up, up north. And you have a series, you also have uh, internal, internal conflicts going on. But what's interesting about the cartels is that, in fact, they really copy the American business uh, practices by vertical integration. What they do is they go into a particular area, into a city, as well as into, into rural areas, and they, in fact, recruit local gangs and then uh, integrate them locally and make them part of their armies. And that's the way in which, in fact, the cartels actually operate. But there's also a, a, a very important part that, in fact, uh, as you will see a little bit later, uh, the way in which militarization is also impacted the cartel. So. But the impact of cartel violence in Mexico has been egregious. New cartel, new cartels morph as emerging as, as in fact, as they're split up, as they're shown here. While this visual does not include the latest the, the, the latest mutation of the arms trafficking in the U.S. In Mexico, between January of 2006 to May of 2021, 350,000 people have been killed and 72,000 disappeared. In a short six year span between 2015 and 2021, the homicide rate increased by 76.3%, or 26.6 deaths per 100,000 persons or over 34,000 victims. And according to this source, it equates up to approximately 94 homicides per day. The international war on drugs until the present presidency of Mexico has resulted in fragmentation of the cartels. Simultaneously, cartel violence is rising. In 2019, 17,000 homicides in a six-month period were committed. For the entire year of 2019, almost 35,000 murders were so you can see that, in fact, the, the, the 
the impact of the cartels have been enormous uh, on the daily lives of people, and even to the to the degree in which, in fact, they have all, they're already threatening the Mexican state. Uh, if some of you have not heard of the Cunha Canasso, the Cunha Canasso was in fact the taking over of streets, uh, blocking of streetways in 2019, uh, the capture uh, because of the capture of uh, Chapo Guzman's son, uh, known as El Raton. They captured him, but uh, in fact what, what occurred was the, the response by the cartels themselves was so strong that uh, the president of Mexico, uh, was in fact uh, called on telephone and he had uh, Raton, uh, Raton uh, released. So you have an, uh, a real danger to the Mexican state. This happened again in February of this year, except he was captured and then taken to the Mexican state. But there were, there were actual uh, bullets fired at uh, air riders uh, that were taken off in, in the in Culiacán uh, and trying to shoot down the, shoot down the air rider. Uh, you know, they allegedly thought that, uh, that the Raton was in fact being, being taken by the Mexican military. They did shoot down a helicopter that way in the middle Further north, the town of Margarita, Sonora, 16 miles south of Nogales, Arizona, was taken over by cartel gunmen. Founded in 1688 by Father Jose de Aquino, it's a town where I spent childhood visiting with Tucson, the walking from my aunts and uncles home to drink ice cold in the neighborhood place. Where in the warm evenings, young men and women would walk in opposite direction, flirting and creating possible emotional moments. At times, bands would play to accompany the beat from the, from the cicadas. Things changed drastically in the present. The music was now being created by assassins shooting AK 47s against the street. With the time of Caborca, Sonora taken over by 20 armed cartel trucks and one tank. On February the 18th, 2022, the cartel killed two people, kidnapped two young athletes, and terrorized the town with police, and federal troops only minutes away. So the armed police officials stated that the kidnapping was more than likely an error, which seemed to be its only defense for lack of response on the part of authorities. The cartel in general, of course, differs somewhat ideologically in an organization, and we won't take that up in this analysis, but only providing an insight into their efficacy and prominence and manner of the same time Mexican society and culture by the involvement of militarization in conjunction with the militarization of the Mexican military itself. So. There's little doubt then that this development parallels the militarization of the Mexican military and itself a consequence of American law intensity warfare. But I can show you, in fact, that this militarization continues. These are the various events that I just referred to. And it bribes, for example, raids and takes over Cuyacan, Magdalena, Caborca, and also along the border, especially along the Tohono O'odham in the Sonoran side of the border. As well as the penetration of the cartels is such that if bribes are not accepted by journalists uh, and, and, and uh, not cowed, uh, violence is the most assured method of stirring public fear. And they do this constantly. And here you have, for example, uh, Gisela Mota, who only lasted one day as, as, uh, as uh, the mayor of Texcoco, and she was killed the following day because, in fact, she wouldn't acquiesce to uh, cartel demands. I can point to you, for example, the way in which militarization overlaps by the fact that 30 officers from the Special Air Mobile Air Force trained by the United States in low-intensity warfare tactics were recruited by the Gulf Cartel as a special assassination and shock troops known as Oseta, which eventually morphed and competed, and competed with the Gulf, uh, Gulf, Gulf Cartel and its coastal territories and with it, a scale of violence more intense and murders than ever before. This pattern of recruitment of former Mexican and Central American military members, the latter of whom were also trained by the American military and Israel, used primarily to, ex used primarily to ex uh, exterminate mining populations. The recruitment and training of members of the infamous Salvadorian 13th Street Gang and the Off Street Incorporation and training of marginalized youth, especially from rural areas, became the sources of cartel 
current knowledge of the As Valdez summarizes the impact of those setas by stating, quote, the creation expansion of, of the setas at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the new century was a true inflection, inflection point that would initiate a new movement in the history of organized crime in Mexico, the organization of criminals, real mechanisms to kill. They had recruited more than 300 setas to the project. This shows you, of course, the, the flow and direction of American farms. Such killings are made possible by an intensive market for weapons, illegally imported by the cartels. According to data from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, of the 106,000 guns, recovered by law enforcement as part of criminal investigations in Mexico from 2011 to 2016 and submitted for tracing, 70% were originally purchased from a licensed gun dealer in the United States. These U.S.-linked guns likely represent only a fraction of the total number of guns that cross the city border, as they only account for guns that were recovered by law enforcement during a criminal investigation and submitted to ATF for tracing. Other estimates suggest that close to 213,000 firearms are smuggled across the U.S. every single year. According to the U.S. government, to the GAO, nearly half of the U.S. source guns recovered in Mexico are long guns, which include high caliber semi automatic rifles such as AK and AR variants. And I would suggest one more. And this is the 50 caliber Barrett uh, sniper rifle, which, is, which can in fact uh, knock somebody off from a two, a, almost two miles. This is the favorite weapon that's, that was used in Kuyakan. As a matter of fact, this is picture showing uh, the, uh, the impact of one of those rifles on one of the soldiers who in fact sheared his entire leg off. So these guys are not playing around. There is another aspect to this that people are not willing to admit, and that is, this is what cartel militarization looks like. And as you can see, the guy on the right-hand side is very well equipped. He's, he's got, uh, I, can, I can't quite tell from here, but I, I think that's uh, an AK-47. Uh, and what you see is uh, a homemade tank at the very top, and you see, in fact, the cartel members are all similarly dressed in there, and they all have military training, but they're being trained by, not mostly by former uh, Mexican Army Special Forces. One of the biggest issues, of course, is the corruption of the military itself. And here you have, in fact, uh, General Salvador Cienfuegos, who was arrested in the United States, but he was immediately backed out uh, by protest by the Mexican government. Uh, to the United States that he's free now. He was identified as the chief of, uh, among the 